Welcome, everyone. I'm Hassan, first year medical student from the Boston campus, and I'm excited to kick off tonight's event championing, championing LGBTQ plus health and inclusion with Dr. Mitch Flynn. Um, I'm a first year medical student at the Health Science Campus, and I'm also one of the leaders of the Biomedical Queer Alliance. Alia Philical Leader of mine is here with me. Um, we're an organization dedicated to connecting and strengthening the LGBTQ plus community of students and professionals across the Boston campus. Um, that work started for me when I was an undergrad here, um, just this past May, I graduated. Um, and it's a joy to continue that work in medical school and to be part of this event that gets on both of the, of the campuses on the same day. I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Lund earlier today at the medical school where he spoke with the top students across um, the different degree programs with TAs, PhD students, PhD students, and other MD students about his professional, personal, and civic journeys. One of the goals of the Leon, Leon and Bentheim Citizenship Award is to connect top students with alumni leaders who are doing critical work in their field or the community to strengthen slip life. You'll hear more about the award from Dean Cunningham in a few moments. I want to uplift how important and impactful that connection between students and alumni can be. It's a powerful thing to learn from those who have forged their unique civic pathway while you're building your own. Before I introduce Dean Cunningham, I want to thank our co-sponsors, the Community Health Department and the LGBT Center, where it worked just a couple of years ago, <laughs> um, for their support and collaboration. We admire the work they do to support the Tufts community, especially its students. For folks in the Zoom room today, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions during the event. If you have a question or two for tonight's guests, please submit them via the chat at any time. Tish staff will do their best to share them on your behalf here in the room. Now I'm pleased to introduce Dean Cunningham. Dana Cunningham is the Pierre and Pamela Omidyar Dean of Tufts University's Jonathan M. Tisch College of Civic Life. She joined Tisch College in 2021 and has devoted her career to promoting civic participation, building community partnerships, and advocating for under underrepresented communities. Prior to Tisch, Dean Cunningham was the founder of Community Innovators Lab, or CoLab at MIT. At CoLab, she built large scale, multi sector developmental collaborations that combine sustainability, wellness, and democratic control of colonies in marginalized communities. As a civil rights lawyer by training, Dean Cunningham has spent several years with the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, litigating cases in Arkansas, Tennessee, Louisiana, Mississippi, and other states in the South. She earned her undergraduate degree from Harvard and Radcliffe Colleges, a JD from NYU School of Law, and an MBA from MIT Sloan School of Management. Please welcome Dean Cunningham. Thank you, Hassan, for that lovely introduction. Welcome, guests. It's great to see you. such a special welcome. Uh, it's good to have you, Hassan, and you, Dr. Lund, back here in this building. We were hearing stories before of how horrible this building used to be. Maybe you can <laughs> regale the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was on this campus, they developed a deep friendship and they decided together to create an award for Tufts alums who really embody the civic values and mission of Tufts University. And so we just want to give a big Shout out to JB and Tom. Thank them for their support uh, and their friendship. And by the way, they're, um, and so this award, the Lion and Ben but Bentheim Citizenship Award, honors leaders who are making a difference. And uh, 
Dr. Lung certainly embodies that. He has been named this year's recipient in recognition of how he dedicated his career to championing sexual and gender minority people, SGM, uh, in healthcare and beyond through innovative technology and participant powered research. So uh, Dr. Lun is Associate Professor of Medicine and Epidemiology and Population Health at Stanford University School of Medicine, specializing in nephrology. That's the kidneys, right? That is correct. <laughs> Uh, he sees primary care patients and provides gender affirming care to SGM patients in Stanford's LGBTQ plus health program. And he also consults on hospitalized patients with renal diseases, electrolyte abnormalities, and acid based disturbances at Stanford Hospital. That is a big <laughs> portfolio. <no? laughs> That's huge. Sorry for the stress. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Dr. Lund is a physician scientist. I would also say that he is a citizen physician scientist, all of those being extremely important. And of course, the first one, a hallmark of Tisch and the Lion Bentheim Award. Um, he investigates SGM health and utilizes existing and emerging technologies to characterize the health and well-being of underrepresented and vulnerable communities. SGM people, which primarily includes members of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer communities, face numerous health and healthcare disparities. Dr. Lund's work focuses on improving understanding of the factors that positively and negatively influence SGM health, including research on SGM health disparities, societal experiences, provider education and integral to this work is his leadership of the PRIDE, all caps, PRIDE study, a national online prospective longitudinal general health cohort study of over 24,000 SGM adults using state-of-the-art web-based research platform. The PRIDE study is supported by the community engagement efforts of PrideNet, a participant-powered research network of SGM people that engages SGM communities at all stages of the biomedical research process that Dr. Lund also co-directs. One of the, we talk a lot here at Tish about the importance of the voices of people who are marginalized. And I think one really important, and, and how the voices of and insights of marginalized people actually contribute to the well being of the whole. And one really recent, I think, important example was the, um, the LGBT community in Provincetown uh, speaking out about uh, epidemic management, right? And actually contributing really important epidemiological insights for the entire country about how to manage COVID. So it's just one minor example of how important this kind of work is to the whole society. Um, the goal of the PRIDE study and PRIDE Net is to improve the health of SGM people, asking the question, how does being LGBTQ plus influence physical, mental, or social health? Here at Tufts, Dr. Lin was a biology and French double major, impressive, whoa, um, before he went on to earn a doctor of medicine degree from Stanford University School of Medicine and a master's degree in advanced studies in clinical research from the University of California, San Francisco. He completed his internal medicine internship and residency training at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston before returning to California for a nephrology fellowship at UCSF. In a moment, I'm going to turn the program over to Jen Greer Morrissey, uh, my colleague, who will kick off the conversation with Dr. Lund. First, a little bit about Jen. Jen is the Civic Life Manager for Health at the Health Sciences Graduate Schools of Medicine, Dental Medicine, and Veterinary Medicine. I'm looking forward to your journey since graduating from Tufts and your civic pathway to addressing change and championing sexual and gender minority people in healthcare and beyond. 
Before we start our conversation, I'd like to ask Dr. Lund to join me at the lectern. <laughs> I'm looking for it. Oh. <laughs> that part wasn't rehearsed. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Lund, in recognition of your outstanding civic leadership, it is my pleasure and my honor to present you with the 2023 Lion and Bentheim Citizenship Award. Congratulations. Beautiful. Thank Over you so to you, Jen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dean Cunningham, and thank you for being here. Welcome. Of course, and delighted. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, we are so thrilled to honor your work in activism um, with this award. Um, so just to start off, and you, as, as Dean Cunningham mentioned, you majored in biology and, fre and French, including, I think, taking some classes in this building, um, <laughs> and graduating in 2004. So can you talk more about your professional journey since you were at Tufts and anything about how your time on campus affected that journey? Sure. Before I start and answer that, I just want to say I'm deeply honored to, the, to receive this award. Thank you to the Tisch College, to to um, to Mr. Lyon and Mr. Benheim for their for their endowment of this award, and it's really uh, really an honor and and fabulous to be back here and see um, some new faces, some friendly from some friendly faces that I know from from years ago, and um, and to meet um, you know the kind of the next generation of of leaders that will be here. And this place is, has such a fond place in my heart um, that it's great to be back in this remodeled building that is not dark and dingy and smells bad like it, like it used to with a brand new jumbo statue, at least to me, brand new. It's probably been here for a decade, but <laughs> out front. So, uh, so, so thank you so much. But, um, you know, uh, I did major in biology and French. So, um, you know, this was, uh, Tufts was an, a fantastic place for me. And my journey, um, really started um, in several ways. So I was, well, you know, before the Tisch College, it was called the University College of Citizenship and Public Service. <laughs> and I was a UCCPS scholar. <laughs> that just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> so, <laughs> and, um, and through that time, I, we had to, you know, do projects as part of our, uh, as part of our scholarship. And um, at that point, Tufts was starting the Summer Scholars Program. And I was um, the first coordinator, student coordinator of the Summer Scholars Program. And that was one thing that really um, appealed to me because Tufts is where I got my start in research, uh, which is now 75% of my time. So, um, and I actually did research not necessarily at Tufts. I did research at a private or a nonprofit institute in Cambridge called the Whitehead Institute. And, um, but I took a variety of classes here, including the one from my favorite professor, Kelly McLaughlin, who I just met with before coming here about, um, and it was a topic in cells, it was topics in cell signaling, it was a seminar class um, that had about 12 students. And it was um, one of the hardest classes I've ever taken <laughs> in my life. And it was because she had us over the course of the semester, write a research grant that you know, was is in the style of the National Science Foundation or the National Institutes of Health. And it really gave me kind of an insight about what my life could be like. And now that's what it is, so, which is great. Um, but, you know, I met a lot of friends here, obviously, that I still keep in close, in close touch with. And this is a place that um, was also where I came out. Uh, I'm from Bismarck, North Dakota, originally. Uh, was not out in high school. And the LGBT Center, uh, I spent many, 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 many days there, uh, many evenings there studying. That was my library <laughs> of places to go. And it was, uh, it was a safe place for me to, to do that. So it was a place where I kind of came to terms with my own identity as a, as a cisgender gay man and as, um, you know, getting involved in civic life that was initially focused primarily on the Tufts campus, and then now has, and getting my start kind of in as my, you know, the tinglings of a research career. And so all those things really began here. 
and have just really grown. I like to say I've become more gay since, I, <laughs> since I've been here. Because now I'm like a professional gay, basically. I get paid. I get paid to do that, right? So, so it's great. And it makes it, um, it's, it's really, you know, enjoyable. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. Um, so your work uplifts the unique health disparities really experienced by sexual and gender minority or SGM people and focuses on improving understanding of those disparities and contributing factors, SGM experiences in healthcare, how providers are educated about these issues, and more in addition to, you know, primary care pathology <laughs> and all the other things. Um, can you talk more about some of the unique health disparities that SGM people face? Yeah, so, you know, the challenge with looking at health disparities in the LGBTQ plus or SGM population is there's really this dearth of data. And that is for several reasons. One is that the federal government doesn't systematically ask sexual orientation and gender identity on important studies, probably the most important study being the census. And so we don't know where LGBT people live. We don't know their races and ethnicities, their ages, their, you know, anything about them. There are a few cities across the country that do a city census. So San Francisco, you know, knows how many LGBTQ plus people there are in San Francisco County, which is the same as the city. Um, but a lot of other places, we don't know that. And so large federal health studies that get done one called the National Health and Health, Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, NHANES, or the National Health Interview Survey, um, they develop their sampling frames, how they actually assess the population based on census data. And so they can't say we're going to ask 50 people from this county and we're going to get this percentage of LGBT people by asking 50 people in this county. Um, and so there's really a lack of federal like data that allows us to do epidemiology, ep epidemiological based studies. The second thing is that most healthcare providers also don't ask about sexual orientation and gender identity. And so the electronic health record, which is now becoming ubiquitous across our lives, stores a lot of information about us. And in fact, lots of research is done using on data, uh, using data that's already collected in the in the electronic health record. Um, because you can get large numbers of people and get information about their health status. Because providers don't ask, because they feel uncomfortable, they feel like it's not their none of their business or all these other reasons, we don't actually have that data in health records either. So we decided we needed to kind of, you know, develop some other way to start studying this. And so the health disparities that exist in the LGBTQ population are largely unknown, although we do know some of them. We know that LGBT people smoke more, than the general population, about two thirds more, one in one in three LGBT people smoke compared to one in five in the general population. There are, you know, huge amounts of of mental health conditions. Um, transgender and non-binary people, forty one percent of them attempt suicide at some point during their life, compared to about one point six percent of the general population. Um, we know that intimate partner violence, people think it's less common in the LGBT population. It's actually either the same or more common in that, pop, you know, more frequent. Um, and there's, you know, a variety of others. And I think, you know, a lot of times this gets to be kind of depressing, <laughs> you know. And so it's not, we're trying to not focus just on the kind of doom and gloom attitudes that oftentimes get focused on in the LGBT community, but also trying to think about what is, why are we so resilient? <laughs> why are we so um, oftentimes very civically engaged, um, very vocal about, you know, and being, you know, rather activist-y <laughs> for, our, for our community and our, and our own needs. Um, and, you know, I think it's an important uh, to note, and I made this comment this afternoon, that it is, it is not being LGBTQ plus that causes health disparities. It's homophobia and transphobia that cause health disparities. Just let, and of course, there are many folks who have intersectional identities, people of color, first generation you know, students, uh, first generation families, people from different you know, socioeconomic or income levels. And it's you know, just like it's not being black or brown that causes a health disparity, it's racism that causes a health disparity, right? So I think these are some of the important things to think about and really how uh, starting to shed light on some of these issues is an important, is an important aspect. And that's one thing that, you know, um, 
we've tried to do in our work um, because visibility is actually a large issue. So for folks who are scientists in the room and you read scientific papers and you look at a table one, which is the demographics of a particular study, never does it have sexual orientation and gender identity in it. It has, it usually says sex, sometimes it says gender, really they mean sex when it says gender. And, um, and so there's this really invisibility of the LGBT community in a lot of the current research. You know, if we look at a study of 10,000 people with diabetes, guaranteed there are LGBTQ plus people in that study. Are they visible in the results? Absolutely not. And so it makes it really, really hard to start looking at some of the, you know, the underlying reasons or underlying aspects in their life that may or may not have contributed to whatever condition is being studied. Um, so you've talked a little bit about so how you got started in this work here at Tufts, and I'm curious, sort of having having worked at the medical school and knowing that medical education and residency is not sort of a natural path to, to incorporate advocacy and all these other things that you're passionate about, though there, there are many pathways, and thankful for Tish's uh, infusion of that at, the, at our med school, um, but can you talk more about sort of how like at what point in your medical career did you realize you could really combine these things or was that something you really set out to do right. in medicine? Yeah, good question. No, it was nothing, as I said today, that knew nothing in my life has been planned. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> um, I've tried to plan it very well <laughs> to the month, but nothing ever happened. Like most med students, right? We're very, very, you know, must do this and then do this and get this grade and move on to the next step. And <laughs> and um, and that did not happen. Uh, thankfully, I'm very happy that it didn't plan, turn out the way that I had planned it. Um, but, thanks. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, so at Tufts, I got a little bit engaged. You know, I think my LGBT work began before my research work. So there was a conference back in the early 2000s called the Safe Colleges Conference, which um, was run many years out of Tufts. And it was a time where, you know, even many colleges were not safe places for, for LGBTQ plus people. And one would argue we still have a long way to go, but it was a lot worse than it even, you know, is, is today, 20 years later. And so I was pretty involved for many years during that, during that, you know, process for every year and had some engagement at the LGBT center. But it was really early in medical school, the first semester when uh, my dear friend and colleague, Juno Obadon Maliver, who's an obstetrician and gynecologist, who is still, I call her my research wife, she calls me her research husband. <laughs> so <laughs> um, we are, you know, co-directors of the Pride Study and Pride Net. And, um, but we met the first semester of medical school. And we both were like, why are we not being taught about anything LGBT in medical school? And we went to, at that point, Stanford deans, and we were like, why is there nothing here? And they're like, well, you need, what are other schools doing, right? Nobody, sometimes schools want to be the first and other times they're a little reluctant, right? So, <laughs> so we said, you know what, we're going to study this. And so we did a national study of medical education, of LGBT medical education. That was a big effort. Nobody thought we could do it. It took many years. We ended up publishing that while we were in residency or in, as an intern. It was a busy time in my life, <laughs> but, but, um, and so that's really kind of the beginnings was, was starting to look at the intersection of LGBT and medical education. Um, we kind of, residency is busy. We took a break for a little while, came back during fellowship and said, we could continue looking at medical education, but instead wanted to pivot a little bit and look at, um, at health outcomes of LGBTQ plus people. And we were in the Bay Area. There's a little bit of technology in the Bay Area. And so we were like, maybe we could use technology as a way to study, to like involve LGBTQ plus people in this process. And so, um, you know, many folks have fear of academic medical centers or medical centers, period, because they've been discriminated against. They've been, um, you know, misgendered or just blamed for their health status or have had unnecessary exams or a whole bunch of things. And so we wanted to do something that was more, um, you know, that allowed people to participate from anywhere. So we used, you know, a web, initially an iPhone app. Not everybody has an iPhone as much as Apple would like that, would like it, would like that to be, and then pivoted to, to you know, web-based, um, a web-based platform for people to engage with us in a way that works for them rather than what works for, for the researcher. And, um, and so that was, you know, a way that we've now kind of pivoted that way. And that's, 
really just continued to grow. And now I, you know, 75% of my effort is devoted to research. So that's why I do very little clinical, you know, less clinical time and, and more research. And that's um, just continued to grow. And is something, of course, that I'm very passionate about addressing some of those health disparities that you looked at, that you discussed earlier, but also looking at what makes people happy <laughs> and what, you know, how are we so, uh, you know, resilient and, and continue to do, um, you know, great, great work. Um, and we've done that, you know, in collaboration with the community rather than the ivory tower of academia, because what I'm interested in may be something that the community has absolutely no interest in, in studying. Yeah, I, I was just going to ask exactly about that. I mean, I, I love that you use the term participant powered research. I've heard community based participatory research, but I'm like, I really like participant <laughs> powered piece. So I'd love to hear more about Pride Net and the Pride um, study and how you envision building um, that work in the future. Sure. Yeah, thanks. So we decided, uh, Juno and I, early that, um, that our research questions were not necessarily the most important ones. And so, and we did not want it to be a San Francisco Bay Area study. <laughs> we wanted it to be applicable across the country. Uh, since we were taking this technology-based approach, we realized that, you know, we could take a big bite. <laughs> and in order to do that, we needed community members from a variety of different backgrounds. That's not just sexual orientation and gender identity backgrounds, but race and ethnicity, lived experience, geography, income, all of these. And so we ended up creating PrideNet uh, kind of at the same time or a little bit before the Pride study. And that uh, we have now a network, we kind of view this as kind of concentric circles in a way. And so we have a community, a participant advisory committee, a PAC as we call it, um, that is made up of up to 15, it kind of fluctuates as people rotate on and off, but that is an advisory committee of people across the country that meet with us every month for two hours. They are paid for their time and um, they advise us on what to do. We think that's stupid that you're doing that, <laughs> or this is great, you should focus on this, or what do you think of this? We you know, come to them and, and they provide advice to us. We also have a set of ambassadors, anywhere from kind of eight to 12 of them. These are usually well-connected spokespeople for the project. They may be connected very well digitally. They may be connected very well to in-person networks. And they um, are also all across the country. We also um, you know, partner with them to review materials and, and other things as well. And those folks are also paid. <laughs> um, and then we have a network of anywhere, usually 30 to 35, currently 32 nonprofit organizations across the country that we partner with as well. So these are LGBT serving clinics, community centers, service and advocacy organizations, and Way Health, for example, in the Boston area. Um, others may be local, like Boston. There may, some are, they range in size and scope. So we have the, a, a trans group in Arkansas that has like, you know, three staff members or something like that. They're writing the grants, plunging the toilets, answering the phone, right? You know, that type of thing versus all the way up to the human rights campaign. People may be familiar with the famous yellow equal sign bumper stickers that you see around. So a big national organization based in DC, hundreds or thousands of employees. And so work with all those and they send materials out to their network. They will review things if we ask them to, they might find a group of people that if they have, a, you know, for working on a particular topic or something, um, they might have just our postcards, or our swag, right? Our Pride study lip balm and other things that they might put in there that might they might put in there in their waiting room if it's appropriate you know that sort of thing so we have these kind of concentric networks of folks that allow us to not just be a San Francisco study and not just you know and get aspects into how things are different in different geographies or for different groups of people and that does nothing but make the study better and make our work our work better. The PRIDE study is spun out of that. PRIDE, as you mentioned, is all capital because it's an acronym that stands for Population Research in Identity and Disparities for Equality. Like most studies, medicine loves acronyms for studies. And so, um, and so um, 
And we decided, you know, we wanted to have a really, you know, way that people can participate. And when they see that we're partnered with all these different aspects of the community and that we report our research results back to them rather than using the community, we partner with them. And I mentioned earlier at noon that about 95% of our team is LGBTQ plus identified. And so it ends up being, uh, you know, they're, we are part of the community. We are doing this to better the community. And so it's not, um, you know, this kind of by us, for us, with us uh, approach rather than um, just using the community, leaving, never disseminating the results, never telling you what the results of your participation were, which of course makes people more distrustful of research and less engaged. So that's kind of one of the approaches that we've taken. And I think you mentioned earlier today, they often see the results First, yeah, 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 we actually disseminated the results to the participants before anybody else, before my division chief and department chair who cares that I'm publishing, it goes to the, it goes to, it goes to the participants first. And we tell them that, you know, we give them a, a, a summary of the results, what we call a community friendly summary written in not scientific language. Um, we usually publish all of our papers open access so that you don't have to pay $75 for a hot second of your, for one download or something like that you know, and, um, and, and we give, um, we create some slides as well. So people can share that within their networks as well. So those are some of the, we, you know, the process of keeping the community engaged from the beginning, from what research questions we study all the way through to dissemination at the very end and hopefully implementation later is, um, is really an important aspect of what, what we do. And we figure that keeping that thread throughout the entire way is, is a really key component of keeping folks engaged. That's amazing. That's great. Thank you. Um, so for the students who are here tonight, especially those pursuing careers in medicine and community health, or I guess advocacy, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, what is your advice to them? And we're hopefully both, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I think the biggest thing that I can say is there's been times where I've been told and Juno and I've been told, you're never going to do this. <laughs> like, it's like, you know, you're, it's career suicide to study LGBTQ health and we've gotten that because it doesn't fit into the, the silos of medicine. So folks who know medical schools and medical departments and hospitals, there's a department of surgery and a department of internal medicine and a department of psychiatry and a department of dermatology. And we, our work doesn't fit into any of those silos, right? So, um, and so then it was like, you're never gonna be able to find a home. <laughs> you're never gonna be able to do this. So I think the thing that has driven me is, is passion and making a difference, right? And being as, um, as engaged as I can and know that there is so much <laughs> that needs to be done that devoting your life or career to it is a, is a, is a great way, you know, to, to one, better the community that you're a part of, um, be an ally to perhaps other communities that you're not a part of, so in my case, you know, I like to say that I try to be an ally to the transgender and non-binary community of which I am not, but I try to learn about the struggles that they face, do some research that will hopefully help improve their health and where is when well-being. And, um, and so I think, you know, the biggest advice that I can give is find things that you're passionate about. Don't take no for an answer, <laughs> because I think that's uh, because if, if you align yourself with mentors, with advisors similar before you, or people who um, you know have good lived experience, um, that anything is possible, and so. Um, you know, I often, we oftentimes get, I think we've all had these things where you've emailed somebody and they're like, well, we haven't ever done that before. So I don't know if we can do that. That is like never an answer. When I get that back, I'm like, okay, <laughs> here's the deal. Let's talk about the ways that this could happen. Right. You know, and, and you know, even at Stanford, Juno's in, in OBG, a department of OBGYN, I'm in medicine. We have grants that like merge across and like, 
just the financials across two departments is like a thing. And so now we have a monthly meeting, me, Juno, and each of our grant managers, and we all come together and we share our screen because everybody can only see one half of the side. <laughs> and it just works now, right? So like you can always be creative and innovative and just figure out a way to get it done. And don't be afraid to ask for help. I think the other thing is to be polite, to be nice, to, you know, to build relationships is the other really important thing in order to get things, to get things done. And so saying, you know, asking, you know, your administrative folks, say hi to them, right? They're not just the person doing whatever, right? You know, they are incredibly critical for getting things, for getting things done and for, for helping you navigate some of these very complex bureaucratic things like universities. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know what you mean. Right. <laughs> um, so I have one last question for you before I turn it over sure. to some the audience questions, and then we'll have some delicious food. Sure. So is there either a favorite memory of Tufts from when you were a student or a thing that you wish you'd done or taken advantage of while you were here? Mm. So I have lots of favorite memories. Um, <laughs> Many of them were unhealthy, including, <laughs> <laughs> including so my my stressed out meal at the LGBT center was a small pepperoni pizza from this from Espresso's Pizza, which is closed. Oh. Which is closed. I know. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Right. Everybody. Yeah. You're right. Right. Um, combined with um, a one liter bottle of Coca Cola, <laughs> combined with a pint of Haagen Dazs strawberry ice cream, that would keep me going from you know 7 p.m. till whatever one or whenever I they were like, please leave the LGBT center. <laughs> we need. We need to go. So I think that you know, and just like you know, hanging out with a bunch of folks in my community there trying to learn organic chemistry or whatever I was trying to do <laughs> at that point. Um, I think one thing that I maybe wish that I would have done more of was to make different connections than I did here. I had no connections to the medical, to the Boston campus mm -hmm. effectively. Um, and I wish I probably would have done more of that. I think I was, um, you know, the bio French thing was kind of weird <laughs> and was, you know, I was, I didn't build as deep a relationships as I probably wish I would have in each of those departments because I was kind of torn between the two. Um, in the end, I love it. As I told folks earlier, I go to France like three times a year and like listen to French music all the time and it's very good and I read French newspapers and all these other things. So I'm, I like, it's, if, like my other passion is France and everything French. So, so, uh, so I think there's, you know, those things I wish I would have maybe done a little bit more. I think I probably also would have not as been maybe so serious hmm. as I was when I was here. The pre-med life can be a little crazy making uh, for those of you that are in the room that have either done it or are doing it. It can be very stressful, um, you know, big emphasis on grades and tests and doing well and doing clinical work and volunteering and doing research and doing all the things. And pretty soon there's no time for anything else. And so I wish I would have, of course, all of this is in hindsight, <laughs> you know, uh, that, you know, what matters is not necessarily a grade in a class, but the other experiences and relationships and friendships that get made. So I think those are maybe some other things that I wish I would have done a little differently. Well, you have a connection but I have, to med school now. Exactly, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and they're not like regrets, yeah, right? No, you know, they're just, you know, yeah. and I'm, I'm not like laying in bed, oh, I wish I would have <laughs> done this 20 years ago, right? So. <laughs> no, well, thank you. Sure. Um, I'd love to open it up to audience questions. Hi, I'm Lisa. I actually went to Tufts um, for undergrad, and now I work here at Health Services. Oh, cool. Um, and I majored in French, and I was pre-med. Awesome. <laughs> yes, there's another one. Okay. I, I, I like turned off and I went to NP school instead. So, Great. Um, but I wanted to ask but one of my things I do a lot of is um, teaching like my old NP school how to teach LGBTQ health to the new students. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned that you had like started to kind of do that in med school and did that research, which I'm fairly sure I quoted in one of my projects. <laughs> um, I think so too. I do the same thing yeah. in my PA program. I'm Mariah, one of the PAs. Uh -huh. and I, when you were talking about that research in Stanford, I was like, oh, yeah, I that's not what we're starting. <laughs> so I was wondering if 
now, like if you're seeing people like either like, are you using the research that you're now doing to push for change in medical education? Like are other people doing that? Like is anything like that happening? Yeah, great question. So, um, so the, uh, yes, things, you know, uh, I used to get frustrated by incremental progress. I wanted giant leaps, um, but now incremental progress. I realize that that's the way the world works. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, we're seeing, I think, a lot more schools realize that there are um, more and more people who are coming out about their sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, now about 21% of folks 18 to 25 are identifying as LGBTQ+. Um, and so that is forcing. <laughs> Medicine is rarely on the cutting edge of society. <laughs> and so um, and so that is what's, I think, forcing new education, right? I would get very frustrated, for example, taking medical licensing exams. It used to be where I could read a 33-year-old gay man and I could stop reading the rest of the question and find a list of answer choices that either were HIV related or HIV opportunistic infection related. And that was the correct answer. It was anybody who's gay has HIV. I'm like, can somebody just have diabetes? And like, <laughs> like that's it, right? And, and now that's what's happening is you're getting this kind of you know, there'll be a social history and a question stem that they live with their, you know, they're married to their husband, blah, 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 blah. And it's just about their blood pressure and it's fine, right? You know, that sort of thing. And so I think we're making progress where we're not binning people as much as we used to. And now many medical schools never before had sexuality as a thread that was, you know, there's kind of thread leads and these other, I mean, every medical school, the human body is the same in all 50 states. So the medical schools have to, make something to make them unique, right? You know? So they have various curricula, various programs and other things. And um, and that's one way that I think, you know, they've now we've infusing that into various aspects of the curriculum. We're actually repeating our medical education study that was done before. So that data has been collected and is being analyzed. I don't know what it is right now, so I can't give you any, any hot <laughs> tips, but, uh, but um, I think we're gonna see an increased amount of LGBT related content in medical education and not just like gay and bisexual men and transgender women in HIV, right? You know, like moving away from, and moving away from STIs and just like broadly. When you're hospitalized and you might be, you know, unable to talk for yourself or make your decisions, how do you respectfully figure out who the decision maker is, right? You know, and not assuming that the person in the room is their sister when it's their wife, right? You know, or something like that, right? So I think there's these, these are the, the, it's, I think it's actually right now more art of medicine than science of medicine that needs to be taught there. And it's all the social related interactions and ways to make experiences more welcoming and affirming for people. We've made progress, not as much as me or many other people would like. But I'm happy with it. <laughs> sure. Yes. I am Diane Ryan. I'm associate dean for programs and administration. So one of those people that you are encouraging others to be nice to. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. It's also great men in college, but that's the story. <laughs> um, you mentioned. Um, well, I don't know if you mentioned this, but I mean, I'm. I, I'm concerned about that intersection of sort of politics and how it's going to affect research funding. Yeah. And I'm guessing that, you know, an LGBT patient in Massachusetts or California is probably going to be okay, but not like Florida or Texas. Um, so I'm wondering what your, what your, um, if you have any insights into how the federal funding picture looks to continue this work. And then what you're hearing from colleagues from other parts of the country about, you know, just being able to do things with the results. Yeah, absolutely. So the um, the federal funding aspect, fortunately, I think is pretty good <laughs> for a variety of reasons. The one main one is that was it maybe late 2016, um, the uh, National Institute for Minority Health and Health Disparities, which is one of the institutes of the National Institutes of Health, declared SGM populations as a health disparity population for research. Mm -hmm. 
all of us who were in the field were like, no, duh, we're aware, <laughs> right? But <laughs> it was great to have that designation because what that actually created was SGM folks are now included in the long list of underserved or vulnerable populations that the NIH uses. And that has opened up a variety of funding opportunities, some of which are limited to only that list of populations, um, and was really um, also prioritized under the Obama administration, um, was the foundation of the founding of an organization called PCORI, or the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which is a non-governmental, nonprofit, independent research organization that actually gets funded by the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. And so every insurance company has to put, I forget the exact amount, it's like a dollar and 10 cents every year for every person that that insurance company insures has to put into a trust that is managed by PCORI. And so they're a funding agency, just like the NIH or National Science Foundation, and you can write a grant for them to them. And they, since their beginning, have listed LGBTQ plus persons as one of their target populations. So thank you, Obama, for many things, but, <laughs> but also that. And so that organization, which is how actually PrideNet was initially funded, was from a, a PCORI grant um, in the infrastructure award to kind of create infrastructure. Of course, during the Trump administration, you may remember that like words like transgender were banned from the CDC and blocked off of all these websites and things. I think that that's, I hope that that's, we've gone by the wayside, everything's back. You can write all these grants. Now people are getting grants funded. The additional thing is that the NIH has a SGMRO, the Sexual and Gender Minority Research Office. So there is a designated office with a several full-time staff members that focus on SGM-related research. They have a coordinating committee that includes one, at least one person from every institute and center in the NIH. So there's kind of a go-to person, you know, whether you're a mental health person, a kidney disease person, there's actually a designated person who looks at the spending on SGM-related research. And over the past five years, for sure, they do a portfolio analysis every year on their website, increased spending to SGM-related research every year as we're going forward, and not just HIV AIDS related, which was what it was like all <laughs> beforehand. We're starting to you know, move away or we still fund that, but also fund, fund other things. So I think that that's you know, all going well. The implementation of things in various states, these next few years are gonna be bad, especially for, for our transgender friends and colleagues. Um, now more than you know, 300 anti-LGBT related bills percolating through state legislatures right now, most of them trans and non-binary focused. Um, inappropriate questioning from representatives, which you can watch online if you ever wanna get angry. And, uh, um, and it's gonna be very, very difficult, you know, from the don't say gay bill in Florida to, you know, many, many, many other, you know, things being criminalized or, you know, being, you know, providers being put in jail for providing gender affirming care and many things that are, um, you know, just, it's gonna, we're gonna take a couple steps back, I think in the next couple of years for some of these things, and it's gonna be really hard and people are gonna get sick. People are gonna die, unfortunately, from a lot of this, um, you know, and obviously abortion is a whole other <laughs> topic, which is of course, you know, very poignant right now. And that applies to LGBTQ plus people. Uh, as well, you know, we've done studies that have shown that, you know, that uh, about 12% of about eight, about 1800 transgender people assigned female sex, female or intersex at birth, uh, about 12% of them have had an abortion. And about one in five of the people that have had at least one abortion did so without clinical supervision. So there's going to be, you know, and, you know, we have already Let's just take you're not LGBTQ plus and you live in a state. People are traveling, you know, hours and days to get, you know, traveling to states. And that's, of course, if you have the means and financial resources to do so. So we're going to have some <laughs> issues, I think, in the next in the next you know, years. Um, and so it will be important for all of us to 
vote, <laughs> to advocate, to, um, to campaign, to spread awareness, all the things that we can do even in states that are much more welcoming and affirming like Massachusetts and California. Thank you for your question. Yeah. Um, I'm Yoshin. I'm a freshman here and I'm majoring in biology as well. Right. Um, so <laughs> I'm looking into um, just like my biomedical career paths and recently just like LGBTQ advocacy, advocacy mm -hmm. has been an interest of mine and uh, not so set on med school. So I was wondering if you <clears throat> know any other pathways that people or colleagues, whatever, have taken to get involved in, um, in uh, LGBTQ advocacy have taken and like how to get your foot in the door. Sure, yeah, so there's lots now, thankfully, we have lots and lots of organizations that are starting to advocate for LGBTQ plus people. And so, um, you know, that includes, I think, finding <laughs> which ones resonate most with you. If you're interested, there's, you know, various parts of, you can be as broad or narrow as I think you wanna be. If you're interested in, the cardiovascular health of LGBTQ plus people, there's now advocacy routes for that, right? So, and it, I think it kind of depends whether you wanna be a researcher, wanna be a public policy person, wanna look at legal aspects of things, look at public health related aspects. Many of these, many broad organizations now, like let's take the, uh, the American Public Health Association, the APHA, they now have, you know, an LGBTQ plus kind of group that has, you know, those listservs connected to a variety of public health organizations that might be, you know, that have internships, that have folks who you could even just talk to and see how they created their career. Obviously, I'm somebody you can talk to if research is an, is an important part of your, your career. There's legal organizations that focus, you know, Lambda Legal is probably the most famous one that focuses, and, and GLAD is here, right? Or at least used to be in the Boston area. So gay and lesbian advocates and defenders is a is a is a, a LGBT legal based organization. There's um there's um you know transgender law center. There's a whole bunch of these that even maybe more legally focused in their name, but work on public policy and not just bringing up lawsuits for <laughs> discrimination and, and stigma. And so there's really, I think, you know, many of them have internships, many of them allow people to volunteer for them. Many of them don't require that you're in the same area as, as you know, where their home office is. And so, you know, the pandemic, if anything, taught us that we don't actually need to be in person for a lot of things, right? So many of you may have been in school during the pandemic and like you may have hated it, but at the same point, um, it's, you know, opened up, the, you know, our eyes and technology has been developed that we can, of course, do a lot of work um, and work with folks, not necessarily face-to-face. -face. There are lots of benefits to being face-to-face, -face, but it does open up some options. So I, I think that, um, you know, I first got involved in research at the Whitehead Institute in Cambridge by sending cold emails um, that were short-ish, <laughs> expressed my interest, and actually showed that I did some background reading about what that particular, in my case, faculty member was doing. It wasn't just like, hi, I'm Mitch. Well, I want to get involved in research. Like me, please. <laughs> right? You know? It was a little more you know, in-depth than that but not crazy because if it's too long, nobody's going to read it, right? So there's this fine balance. And so I think, you know, that and not, not to be discouraged by um, not hearing back, right? I sent out a bunch. I only heard back from a few. That person that I ended up hearing back from was somebody who I worked for for three years while I was at Tufts and one year before I started medical school. I moved with him as his lab moved from, from Whitehead Institute to Columbia. And so, and I knew I was taking a year off. And it was a great, I had a great, and he was a fabulous, outstanding mentor. And I still email with him every couple of years. I'm like, hey, Brent, here's what I'm doing. What's up with you? Oh, you're chair of your department now, you know, or something like that, right? So I think um, don't be afraid to email people, but also don't take rejection as, um, as a, you know, insult to you or who you are. Thank you. Sure. 
So I'm a graduate student at the Fletcher School mm -hmm. studying the intersection of gender and international affairs. Okay. So this is going to be uh, a related question. <laughs> um, so I was wondering if you could share your perspective on studying SGM um, inclusion and health on a global scale mm -hmm. and any critical questions that humanitarian practitioners should be asking. Sure. This is like not my largest knowledge set. So let me let me share with what I know. So um, so I think there's, you know, there are many, many, many countries where being gay or trans is punishable by death, <laughs> right, much less um, supported and welcomed. So there's a lot of work related to that space. Um, and I think this relates a lot to asylum seekers, especially in the United States or in other in other countries that are more welcoming. Um, um, and so that's, um, you know, one aspect that's there. The United States is at rather advanced in gender affirming care, but there are other countries who actually do it better <laughs> than we do. Um, so, you know, uh, the Netherlands has been doing this for a very long time. There's lots of studies out of the Netherlands about gender affirming hormones. Um, Sweden, you may know, has a national health record. Wouldn't that be nice if we had that here? We had that here. Um, so every single person in Sweden who has seen a physician is into a single database. So they have great work for for research because every single person who's and you don't even have to be a Swedish citizen, of course, is the other thing. You, if you were to go there and break your foot and you get into, you would be entered into the Swedish, you know, system and, you know, information about you, whatever they collect would be there and available for, for research purposes. So, so other countries do this better than, better than we do. The challenge is that some countries, and we mentioned it briefly earlier today, is um, especially the countries that have a very gendered language. So all of the romance languages <laughs> that have, you know, gendered articles, gendered nouns, and thus usually adjectives that match in gender and number to the noun, like French, uh, um, have, it's hard to be a transgender person or not, especially a non-binary person there, because those non-binary or neutral, <laughs> gender neutral uh, pronouns and, ad and articles don't exist. Um, and so, um, you know, those are struggles that all these countries are going through right now. And there are large movements because they view that as actually a huge barrier to being welcoming. Imagine it's very much like mis being misgender, right? You show up and they're like unsure to use, you know, le or la with you. And, and so there's now these, you know, new contractions that are coming out. And of course, these have to get in France. They have to get through, you know, l'Académie Française, which is like obviously you know, a bunch of old white men that make a decision, you know, 20 years later about what words should be added to the French language. So, so I think there's lots of advocacy, even just around language in many of these places. And like most countries, um, uh, there's not a lot of gender affirming care providers. And so I think that's the other part where, where um, the international part needs to, there needs to be educational programs in many of these countries that can help improve the humanity there, <laughs> um, you know, because even I mean, I'm, I even say this in San Francisco. So I am a cisgender gay man. Do you know how hard it is to find a, a LGBTQ affirming primary care provider in San Francisco? Very, at least who like will actually publicly say that there, you know, there is no LGBT health clinic at the University of California, San Francisco Medical Center. There is a transgender clinic that only deals with folks transitioning. But if you want to be, you know, a gay man, white privileged guy who's a professor at, you know, one of the best universities in the country, you got to like do your homework about what, you know, and talk to people about who the correct doctor to go to is. And that's in San Francisco where there's 16% LGBTQ plus people, right? You know, so what's that like in Bismarck, North Dakota, where I'm from, where I grew up, right? You know, and so... So there's a lot of work here, but that that I think is is worse in almost every every other place, aside from all the legal and public policy related things. You know, there are many, I've had many friends who've traveled to various countries um, with their partner, but we're just friends in, you know, 
you know, when we're checking into the hotel or when, um, you know, yes, we'll have two beds, but they get pushed together, <laughs> right? You know, so, and it's it's just really a shame that kind of all of those, you, people have to hide who they are in other places. And so I think that, and that of course affects people's health, right? That's that's homophobia, that's transphobia, that's, that's you know, and of course you just want to do it because you don't want to be, you know, one discriminated against or two hurt, which is a real threat in many places. So thank you. Thank you for doing what you're doing because that's a big task. <laughs> Are we on time? Do we have time for one more question? If there's one more, sure. Yeah, one more questions. Um, so your uh, research is really, talk about how it's very patient focused and they're the ones who are choosing what you're researching. Has there been, have there been any topics that were like put forth to you as this is what we want you to research that you've been really surprised about? Yeah, actually the moat, which we haven't done research on, but the one of the highest rated topics we did, our iPhone app that we did a while ago was actually used to crowdsource research ideas from the community. And that was its kind of sole purpose. And one of the top uh, items that got presented, which was not one thing that we couldn't do anything about, was improved sex education in K through 12 schools. Mm. And people didn't learn how to either protect themselves against sexually transmitted infections. They didn't know how to have sex. They didn't learn, you know, pregnancy prevention or any of these things um, in their in their K through 12 education. And they just kind of learned it by doing it, right? You know, and they wish that they would have had that because it would have been more, um, would have, they would have felt less ostracized. They would have felt um, like, of course, that they could take better care of themselves and their health. And, um, and, you know, and just felt like it was a key component of people's lives that was clearly lacking from their, from their early education. So that's been one thing that we've been very surprised about. Um, we've been, I think the other things we were not necessarily surprised about, we were, I think, surprised at how high they were on the list. So, um, you know, folks were more concerned about family acceptance than some actual physical health related um, things. And so how to, how to interact with family members that may not be supportive or that they might not wanna be you know, out uh, to. And then the intersections of race and ethnicity with sexual orientation and gender identity and how some cultures it's not discussed if you're LGBTQ plus or it's very much you know, forbidden and, you know, and people, of course, you know, some of the other health disparities, a very sad one is that of the, of the homeless youth in the United States, about 40 to 50% of them are LGBT. And that's because they've been either kicked out of their house or they've chosen to leave their house up for their, for their own safety. And in San Francisco, we know that that's between 50 and 60%, again, because San Francisco studies the, the homeless youth. So those are, you know, and that's, a changing society. And I think we're going to face as you know, to your question in the back about the various bans that are happening in various states. I think we're going to see, you know, more of that as, um, as the laws are validating the discriminatory attitudes of some parents and family members, we're going to see, well, you know, see, I told you though, <laughs> the governor said that I'm right and you're wrong, right? You know, that kind of attitude to people, to, to kids, and that's going to be bad, you know, going forward. So um, at the same point, though, we've also, the other one topic was, how about you study why we're so great? <laughs> and what, no, and what makes us happy? You know, I mean, for real, right? You know, and, and it turns out that a lot of the things that people say makes them happy are the community that they've formed, and they may have lost their uh, biological or genetic family and have gained a chosen family that has, um, really, you know, uplifted them, made them healthier, made them happier, and made them well, you know, connected socially. And I think, you know, we know that as people are more well connected socially, that their mental health gets better, they get more inclined to engage with the healthcare system, and they get more engaged to just take better care of themselves. So those, I think, are some of the other, the other aspects that we've, that we've seen. 
And that's what makes me not so depressed about it all the time, you know, <laughs> because because it can kind of just be like, oh, there's all these laws and da 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 da. da. And instead, we need to, you know, I think we need to focus on 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 how much progress has been made. Right? We wouldn't have all the laws going in all these states right now if we haven't been making progress. Right? We've seen that the history has told us this over and over again. Right? Um, that it's reached enough <laughs> to the societal level. It's less underground than it was before that now people are paying attention, especially to transgender and non-binary people, that it's coming across the desks of, of legislatures. We may not like what they're doing, but they're at least seeing it, which is which is actually a hopeful sign to me, even though I hate all of these bills. Um, I do think that, you know, this, we've seen this before, we'll get through it. The arc of justice is long, right? You know, so, yeah. That feels like a good note. <laughs> um, although I have been sitting here thinking about, like, can there be like a Dr. Mitch Lund podcast? Because, like, I just have loved listening to you today, you. and it's just been absolutely such an honor. And I think like, I really would. <laughs> and and if there are ways for us to follow Pride Net or Pride Study, like social media wise or yeah. things like that, so that we can stay informed. And Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. All right. At the Pride Study. Also, pridestudy.org. If you're eligible, please join. We will harass you with emails and text messages. <laughs> but you have the ability to win gift cards, which is nice. <laughs> so, so, and contribute to science, which is the most important part. So, so, so um, yeah, and I'm, you know, and uh, if folks are at the health center, you know, here on campus, happy to, or elsewhere, happy to, you know, mail you stuff for the waiting room and things like that too those are all you know we have all those options so yeah again thank you uh so much for attending today you've been a fabulous audience again i'm incredibly honored um thank you um you know to you jen for 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 facilitating to jess for coordinating everything dean cunningham thank you so much for the wonderful introduction and for this session and it's really just been and to everybody it's been wonderful being here and um, I'm truly honored. So thank you. Of for course. All, <laughs> right, no, for all